from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Carolyn Brown. I direct the Office of Scholarly Programs and the John W. Kluge Center here at the library. And it is my great pleasure to welcome you this morning uh, for a day-long symposium on a very large question indeed. The longevity of human civilization. Will we survive our world-changing technologies? Uh, the symposium has been organized and being, is being presented by Dr. David Grinspoon, the first scholar to hold the Baruch S. Blumberg NASA LC Chair in Astrobiology. Um, we are addressing a huge question with no easy answers, and I'd like to quote um, a colleague of mine, some of you may know her, Pauline Yu from the American Council of Learned Societies, who said in the context of um, discussion about the digital revolution, um, it's too soon to know, but not too soon to ask. And I think we can say that um, today, it's too soon to know whether we'll survive our world-changing technologies, but we certainly had best ask. Um, before we, we begin, let me ask you to um, please mute your cell phones and any other um, items that might um, go off. Um, since it's an all-day symposium, let me remind you there are restrooms. Um, the ladies' restroom is across the Great Hall behind the giant Bible of Mance. Um, <laughs> how's that? We're at the Library of Congress? Um, it's a little bit hard to see, but believe me, it's there. Um, and gentlemen, you'll need to go down the hall as well and down the steps. It'll be on your left behind the um, information desk. Today's program is a product of a collaboration between NASA and the Library of Congress to explore the humanistic implications of the field of astrobiology, to ask what are the societal implications of the search for life beyond Earth. Science can ask specific questions about what exists, how it came into being, what physical processes are likely to unfold in the future. But there are some questions science cannot ask how might we learn about the, the, how the universe affects our understanding of who we are? Um, how does our understanding affect the meaning of our lives? And what should we do about what we learn? The two sets of questions are complementary, and the power of both come together in the collaboration of NASA and the library in this chair um, and in today's program by the chairholder. The idea that we should bring together these two institutions, NASA and the library, as a way of joining intellectual forces of scientific description and humanistic interpretation came from Dr. Baruch S. Blumberg, um, who was a Nobel Prize winner. But what's most important for our purposes um, is he was one of the founding members of the library's Scholars Council, um, which advises the librarian on issues related to uh, scholarship and intellectual life. And he was also the founding director of the NASA Astrobiology Institute. Um, he combined these two uh, dimensions in his person. And when I came into this position, Barry turned up in my office to see if um, I would uh, be willing to sort of contemplate working on this, um, which I was more than delighted. If, if you knew Barry, you knew that not only was he a beautiful person and an excellent scientist, um, but he had a way of, um, in his very gentle way, being very, very persuasive, although this was not a hard sell. Um, so even though Barry did not live to see the realization of his vision, um, we are um, in this uh, astrobiology chair and in today's um, event um, expressing that realization on his behalf. Um, I'll just say a few brief words about the Kluge Center, um, in which the, the astrobiology chair is um, set. The center was established through a generous, generous donation by John W. Kluge in the year 2000 to establish a scholarly venue on Capitol Hill where the uh, world's really most mature scholars and thinkers might have opportunities for informal conversation 
um, with members of Congress and other policy leaders. The idea was to bring together the world of affairs and the world of um, intellect in a, in a way where honest conversation could take place. Um, the center also supports a rising generation of young scholars. We offer a range of programs um, such as the one this morning and you can sign up to get more information in the back or, or uh, sign up for email notifications. We are uh, greatly honored this morning um, to have with us Congressman Lamar Smith. Um, and it is uh, uh, Congressman Smith's uh, presence is a uh, illustration of our best hope about having informal opportunities for, um, uh, for Congress and policy members uh, to learn from scholars, um, and for scholars to learn from congressmen and policy makers, I should add. Uh, congressman Lamar Smith represents the 21st Congressional District of Texas. He also serves as chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, which has jurisdiction over NASA, the Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, National Science Foundation, Federal Aviation Administration, and the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Um, what's particularly uh, um, gratifying and a great pleasure to us is that Congressman Smith has had an opportunity to get to know our first chair, David Grinspoon, um, and, and has generously um, offered to come and say a few words to us as we begin this program. Congressman Smith. Dr. Brown, thank you for that introduction and also thank you for helping to organize today's event. Uh, I only regret I've got to leave and do things like vote and whatnot. Otherwise, I'd be, and I still hope to be back this afternoon, but uh, what an opportunity you all have today. Uh, as you just mentioned, David Grinspoon is the first chair of the, uh, at the Library of Congress of the Astrobiology uh, area. And um, I just thought I'd mention how I got to know David. A few months ago, he was nice enough to stop by my office and talk about science, space, and technology committee issues. And at that meeting, he gave me a copy of his book, Lonely Planets. And I try to read what people give me, but I set it aside. But a couple of weeks later, I started the book. And it was absolutely fascinating, uh, particularly uh, cleverly written. Uh, and I just considered it to be one of the best books I'd written on the, read on the subject. And, um, so I decided to give him a call. I called the Library of Congress and said, can you give me Dr. Grinspoon's telephone number? So I tried to call him a couple of times. And uh, when I finally caught up with David, I just sort of blurted out that uh, he had to be one of the best writers and one of the most brilliant people I'd ever met. And um, that's how I got to know David and why I think I was invited to make some comments today. Uh, <laughs> in all honesty, um, I've got to think how to say this. Um, uh, when I say David is one of the most brilliant people I feel that I've met, about 10 years ago, I met Seth Shostak, who is to my left with SETI out in California. And I had the exact same feeling, and I remember calling Seth and saying, Seth, and I've been telling many people since, you're one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. And uh, let me think how to say this, because I'm a politician and I don't want to offend anyone else here. So I will simply say that it is wonderful for me to be in a room uh, with two brilliant people, uh, leaving the exception open for other brilliant people in the room as well. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to participate in your symposium today to discuss the intersection of technological advances in the future of the human race. Human history is punctuated by great advancements in the exploration of the world around us. This is evidenced by regular breakthroughs in virtually every field of science, including engineering, physics, astronomy, chemistry, and biology. As Americans, we are a nation of explorers. It is an inherent part of our national identity. From our earliest settlers crossing the Eurasian land bridge to Christopher Columbus's landing in San Salvador, from the Lewis and Clark expedition in the west to the exploration of the poles and the study of the ocean's depths, 
We have always looked beyond the horizon, sometimes below it, sometimes above it, for the next challenge. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin transfixed America and the world when they landed on the moon in 1969. The Apollo program proved that we are not permanently tethered to our home planet, and it continues to serve as a reminder that humans will always be explorers. As chairman of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee, I have the privilege of interacting with scientists, astronauts, students, constituents, and researchers. Our conversations emphasize the need for ongoing communications between policymakers and researchers and innovators. Events like this one and programs that inspire our young people to study science, technology, engineering, and math are helpful in ensuring that America continues its leadership in scientific exploration. And space exploration is an investment in our nation's future, often the distant future. It encourages innovation and improves Americans' quality of life. I don't know if space is the final frontier. I do believe it is the next frontier. In Dr. Grinspoon's book, Lonely Planets, he states that, quote, creatures wishing to ensure their survival for millions of years must be space-faring. At a minimum, they must learn how to detect and deflect incoming asteroids and comets, lest they go the way of the dinosaurs. Finally, if they want to survive for billions of years, they cannot avoid interstellar colonization. They must move on before their sun dies. For a truly long-lived society, interstellar travel is not a luxury." End quote. The search for exoplanets is an inspiring and relatively new area of space exploration. And experts predict there are many Earth-like planets just waiting to be discovered. Some of these planets could even contain the first evidence of organic life outside our solar system. Curiosity about life on other planets is something that unifies us all. The discovery of life elsewhere would alter our priorities for space exploration and how we view our place in the universe. And the discovery of sentient life, of course, outside this, outside this uh, solar system would be the biggest news in the history of the world. As we search for answers to some of our most primal questions about the universe, we need to be sure that we support a balanced science and space portfolio that promotes new discoveries. The Science Committee recently passed the NASA Authorization Act, which sets goals and establishes priorities for the greatest space program in the world, NASA. Priorities in the bill include funding the Space Launch System and Orion Crew Vehicle, the Commercial Crew Program, keeping the International Space Station and Hubble Space Telescope operating, launching the James Webb Space Telescope, and supporting NASA's unique planetary exploration program, including NASA's Astrobiology Institute. In a few years, hopefully three years, we will once again launch American astronauts on American rockets to the International Space Station. We should not have to rely on the Russians to get our astronauts into space. I'm just going to digress here for a second. If I have two pictures of space, one is negative, one is positive. The negative is the United States of America paying Russia $73 million to take an American astronaut to the space station and back. Something very wrong with that picture. On the other hand, there is something very right with this picture, and uh, both Seth and David have seen it on the, if you sit at my desk in my office and look on the right-hand wall, you'll see I have a huge poster of a photograph taken by the Hubble deep field view. And uh, this was a dark speck of sky that the scientists uh, decided to point the Hubble at just in case there might be something found in that dark speck of sky. The speck of sky was so small that if you held up a penny at arm's length, Abraham Lincoln's eye would cover that speck. You can't even see Abraham Lincoln's eye on a penny. So literally talking about that pinprick. I don't know how many days, 10 or 15 days every time uh, the, the uh, Hubble came around, they would uh, expose the film for another 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, when they developed the film in that tiny speck of sky where nothing was seen, there were 3,000 points of light. Each point of light, not a star, but a galaxy consisting of hundreds of millions of stars. That's what's out there. That's why we explore. Our human space flight missions have returned to Earth technologies and knowledge that have changed the way America works, communicates, treats illnesses, and defends itself. Human space exploration has done more than provide technological advances. It has inspired the whole human race. And a last quote from Dr. Grinspoon. 
Uh, the view from space seems universally to invoke a feeling of oneness with humanity and life and reverence for our planetary home. Technology has provided us with the perspective that triggers this unforeseen spiritual reflex. By entering space, we begin the transition into homo cosmicus. That's a wonderful phrase. Our challenge today is to honor our space legacy and build upon it with a new vision. We can and we will. America still has the ability to take other giant steps for mankind. Thank you, nice to be with you this morning. Thank you so very much, Congressman Smith. Um, we had uh, expected this morning that a representative from NASA would be here, and I know Mary Wojtek will be here later. She had an unexpected meeting this morning. I don't know, is there anyone else from NASA headquarters? Um, if not at a later point in the day, I'd like to uh, introduce our partner. Um, let us then uh, go on and, and uh, introduce the man of the hour. Um, because today's event is really David Grinspoon's event. Um, Dr. Grinspoon is, as you heard, the inaugural Baruch S. Blumberg NASA LC Chair in Astrobiology. Um, and he came to us fr uh, from his position as Curator of Astrobiology in the Department of Space Sciences at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, his research focuses comparative climate evolution of plants and their implications. Um, I'm not going to go into his full biography, and we won't do that for the other speakers. You'll notice that there are bios in your program. Um, but I do want to uh, just say this um, about David. Uh, to the, today's uh, symposium really is was his concept. Um, the design and structure is his design, and it reflects, um, I think, not only David's research interests, but I think you'll just see that it also reflects his uh, wonderful persona. Um, and finally, and this is the part I like best, David actually did the lion's share of the work on this as well. Um, so when you come to the end of the day and you say, wow, that was fabulous, um, be sure to give um, due thanks um, to David because it really is his baby. And with no further ado, here's David Grinspoon. <laughs> Wow, thank you, Carolyn, and thank you, Representative Lamar Smith, uh, for all those kind words. Um, that was indeed a generous uh, introduction, and uh, now I feel a little bit like the, uh, the stand-up comic who's been introduced by saying, this is the funniest man in the world. <laughs> and boy, that first joke better be good, right? Um, being here at the Library of Congress for this year as the astrobiology chair has been an incredible experience for me. Uh, the the, the uh, Kluge Center has uh, incredible people and the facilities of the library are uh, unsurpassed in the world and being here in Washington I've had the opportunity to interact with a community of, of scholars uh, from many different disciplines and uh, many institutions several of whom you'll you'll meet today and the project that I'm here for that I proposed uh, and, and was selected to be the chair on, on the basis of this proposal was to study what we're calling the Anthropocene era from the perspective of astrobiology. Now, what do, what do I mean by that? Well, first of all, astrobiology is the scientific study of life in the universe. And it's a uh, relatively new discipline or re really a meta-discipline as the name implies combining not just astronomy and biology, but in fact, earth science and, and, and even now a little bit of history and philosophy, really to wrestle with this question of, of life in the universe. Uh, it, what, what is the potential for this universe to make life? So we study the history of life on earth and try to s derive the universals of that that may be applicable everywhere. And we, and we study the environments of other planets and we try to extrapolate and understand where there may be life. Uh, and, and of course, we're searching 
for life. We haven't found it yet, but we found a lot of encouraging clues. Now, the point of establishing this chair was to get scholars to come here and relate that scientific quest to the larger humanistic questions that astrobiology, of course, invokes. As Representative Smith mentioned, if we discover life, and especially intelligent life, it will, it will be profound. It will change the way that we think about ourselves. And even asking that question and contemplating what may be out there is a way to reframe questions we have about ourselves. So that's astrobiology. Now, the Anthropocene is a term that has recently come into wide use by scientists, but now as well uh, increasingly by, by humanists and, and, and the general populace to describe the phase of planetary history that we are in now, that we have entered, where human activities are becoming a dominant factor in the physical functioning of the Earth. And it's actually been proposed as an official term in the, the stratigraphic nomenclature of geology. In other words, you've heard of these terms, you know, Jurassic is famous because there's a movie about it, but um, Pleistocene. The, these different uh, terms we have to, that reference layers in the geological strata that correspond to time periods in Earth. And the idea is that perhaps we've actually entered a new phase that's so profoundly different from the past that it's worthy of a new geological title. Now this is a controversial proposal in some respects, and it may or may not be accepted as an official geological term, but in a sense that doesn't matter because it's, it's done its job in provoking conversations like this where we're really taking a look at what's happening on Earth now, what our role is in these transformations, and what the implications are for our future, which is what we're here to talk about today. The, uh, the Anthropocene is a time of remarkable change on Earth, not only in, in, in a large number of physical quantities that we can, we can name, the changes in the atmosphere, the hydrological cycle. Just to give you one example, there is now more water in all the dams, the human constructed reservoirs of Earth, I think five times more water than there is in all the natural streams of Earth. So that's, a, that's not a minor perturbation. We've, we've, uh, we, we've caused some major changes in the physical functioning of the Earth. But, but in a more fundamental sense, we can say that the rules have changed, the rules determining what happens to the planet. And we ourselves occupy a strange niche in this perturbed world because we're at this point now where we have huge global influence, but we can't really claim to have global control. We are uh, sort of haphazardly collectively doing things that are having a massive effect on the Earth. But not really, nobody sat down and said, hey, let's, let's do this experiment. It's just kind of self-assembled. Self so, so then we come to the, the question that I've used to frame the, the title of this about, about the longevity of human civilization. And somebody pointed out, and I think rightfully critiqued the subtitle, Will We Survive Our World-Changing Technologies? Somebody. Um, tweeted me and critiqued that that was a, a, a pessimistic framing because it seems to imply that we're mostly worried about uh, that we're going to wipe ourselves out with technology. And that, of course, is a concern, and there are many ways that could happen, and we'll address those today. But, but technology, of course, is, uh, is wonderful in a, in a lot of ways. We, we enjoy its benefits. We have a uh, long, uh, longer lifespan and lower infant mortality and all kinds of comforts and you know, aspects of the modern world that we wouldn't trade, probably, for, for uh, earlier eras in history. And also technology, of course, provides the potential for humans to survive threats that otherwise we wouldn't survive. And as, as was uh, mentioned by Representative Smith, uh, the uh, one great example is the dinosaurs did not have a space program. <laughs> and if they did, then they might still be here and we would, we would be a bunch of intelligent lizards or semi-intelligent lizards having this conversation. So that's just one example. Technology, I, I, I didn't mean to imply with this, this phrasing that, that we're only talking about the threats. When we discuss the potential longevity of human civilization, there's also the potential of great longevity that we will get to the point where we know how to use our technology to um, use it wisely and create a sustainable society that will persist 
for a long time, for even potentially a significant time in Earth history. So there's, there's a dual-sided uh, aspect to technology that, that I hope we, we will discuss. Um, you know, one of the really fun things about being astrobiology chair is, and being a scholar at the Kluge Center is that I get to do things like this. And if I think, who are some of the people that I would most like to have a conversation with about one of the topics that most interests me, and then invite them, they'll show up. <laughs> and, and they have. And, and I'm very excited about uh, introducing to you and, and giving you an opportunity to uh, meet and, and listen to the, uh, the, the gathering of scholars that we've brought together today. Uh, I can tell you right now that we're not going to be able to answer this question of the longevity of the human civilization. And so if you, if you really hoped that you would leave today with the answer, you can get up and go now. But, you know, <laughs> none of us have a crystal ball. As a, famous, as a famous songwriter once said, if you want to see the future, all you have to do is wait. But we want to try to do a little bit better than that. You know, there are people that call themselves futurologists, and notably none of them are here on this panel today. But, but we do have tools that we use to try to understand the future. One of these tools are computer models, climate models. They're, they're imperfect, but we're getting better all the time, and we, uh, we, we try to understand, given certain input parameters, what, uh, what's going to happen. But other tools are, uh, for example, literature, the novel, the human imagination, uh, an examination of human history and human origins, and, and trying to understand the, the essential nature of you know, the sort of equipment that we've been provided by evolution and how that may respond in the future to these future challenges. So we have experts in, in several of these fields who are going to combine their expertise for us and try to, try to understand what may be coming down the road. Where, where is this all going? Can we get to a point where we have a sustainable society on a long-term basis? Nobody knows. But one hallmark of the human species is our great adaptability, our great flexibility in the face of new challenges. It's given us a great run so far. Can we keep it going? So I've broken down this discussion into three separate questions that are all related. And we're going to have three panels with breaks in between. Uh, there'll be a lunch break. And then the final, the end, uh, the last part of the afternoon, we'll have a general discussion with all the panelists. And I hope that all of you will join into these discussions. The general format will be the uh, panelists will come up, they'll each make a statement on their point of view, given their expertise and their experience on the topic at hand, and then they'll have a, an opportunity to respond to each other's remarks, and then we'll open it up to you for your questions, comments. And, and when we get to that point, please use the microphones. It's not just about whether we can all hear you, but this is being recorded filmed, it will be edited and posted, so it will be very helpful to us and to future uh, uh, viewers of this, this film if you do use the microphones. So very quickly, the three topics, uh, and, and, and the, the, you can read the questions in your program, but, but I'll give you uh, one word to describe each. The first is about values, the second is about prophecy, and the third is about evolution. In other words, what values do we bring to this discussion? What do we care about going into the future? It's very easy to say we want to save the world and we want life to be beautiful in the future, but what does that mean? Are we mostly concerned with just preserving humans? Are we mostly concerned with quality of life? Do we want to preserve biodiversity? What do we do when biodiversity is in conflict with one of these other goals? Or do we want to preserve the, what they call the charismatic megafauna, the big, um, you know, sexy uh, animals like elephants and rhinos? If, what if that's in opposition to being able to preserve land that allows for a lot of biodiversity of other creatures. So when you really get into what you mean by saving the world, you, you get into these interesting questions of what do we care most about. And these values discussions may help to guide how we think about these other questions going into the future. And the, the second panel, prophecy, is about 
how we think about the future. How, how good are we at thinking about the future? Certainly, it's a hallmark of the human species, one of our cognitive capacities that differentiates us from the rest of life is that we have this remarkable ability, these prefrontal cortex that, that, that we each have in our, in our head to incorporate the past and the future in our minds at the same time. Now, we know that some animals have some degree of this, but humans uh, really have seem to have a unique ability to think about the future and to plan for the future. But how good at, at, are we at that? Are we good enough at it for the, the, uh, these new kinds of challenges we've created for ourselves? And one way to get at this is to look at how well we've done in the past at predicting the future. One of the fun things I've done as part of my research here is I've done a lot of reading about the future that was written 100 years ago or 200 years ago. And it's very interesting to see what kinds of things people got right and what kinds of things they got really wrong and try to apply that to, to our own attempts at prophecy now. Uh, and finally, uh, evolution. Uh, how long might we persist? There's obviously something new going on on the earth, but species come, species go. Are we just going to be a brief geological event like the, the, uh, the little layer of clay that, uh, that shows us the, the impact that wiped out the dinosaurs, which is geologically significant but only actually lasted an instant? Are we going to be some kind of an era? Is the Anthropocene going to be an era that persists for some geologically relevant time? Or is it even possible that we are now at the cusp of a transition, uh, a, a moment in Earth history that differentiates before and after, and that this sentience, this uh, technological presence on the Earth that we've started is something that will actually persist for who knows, the rest of Earth history. So, so there are a lot of different ways of looking at that question. And then we have to ask, what do we even mean by human civilization? You know, some people have pointed out that we could, we could wipe out our civilization in some way, but our species would not go extinct and perhaps would even build another civilization. So there, you know, there, there's some interesting terms that we have to think about. Or, or could, could our civilization transform into something that's unrecognizable? You know, the, the rise of the machines or something. So there are a lot of interesting futures we could consider. Um, we could even define human civilization as that thing that is causing the Anthropocene. Um, which, you know, gets us off the hook with one definition and gets us on the hook with another one. Um, so, anyways, I, 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 I'm just trying to raise some of the questions that I think we'll, we'll dig into, but I want to really seed the stage now to our panelists and get the discussion going. Uh, wanted to mention, um, we are, as I said, we're filming this and it will be posted on the Kluge Center website and the hashtag... The hashtag for live tweeting, for all you kids that are into that kind of thing, <laughs> is, is long civ, L-O-N-G-C-I-V. And we, I know we have some people live tweeting and feel free to join in the conversation um, about this event and the questions that we're raising. Now, our panelists are all people who are incredibly interesting and accomplished. And if I gave each of them the, the full introduction they deserve, then that would basically take up the whole day. So I'm not going to do that because um, we want to spend the time on conversation. So at the beginning of each panel, I will very briefly identify the panelists and say maybe one or two things about them. But then you can read a bit more about them in the program where there are printed bios. Although I'll say even those printed bios are much shorter than they deserve. We would run out of ink uh, to give them all the all the description of, of their accomplishments uh, and interests that they deserve. So I urge you to follow up. They've all got a web presence. They've all written, published books, um, and they're all out there in the media. And please follow up and uh, learn more about these people if they pique your interest. Um, so, and uh, finally, uh, this is meant to be a discussion, so, so please join in. Now, without further ado, I would like to invite the first panel to take the stage, and I will introduce them, and we'll, we'll get going. 
The, uh, the first topic we're going to be discussing is uh, the nature of nature. What should we choose to save? What kind of, what kind of values are we going to take with us as we, as we go into this Anthropocene era? And to discuss this, we have, I'll start on stage, uh, well, on my left, <laughs> with um, David Biello. David is a, a journalist, an editor at Scientific American, and uh, somebody who's really done a lot of very thoughtful writing uh, on the topics at hand here. And that's, uh, I, I will not give him a more full introduction, although he deserves one. You can read about him here. And then sitting next to David, we have Dr. Rick Potts. Rick is a, uh, an expert on human origins. He's at the Smithsonian Institute. He's a paleoanthropologist. He goes to Africa and does fascinating digs. And he's one of the people who's really helped to construct, reconstruct the story of human origins. And he is here today to share that experience um, and his perspective with us. And then sitting next to Rick is uh, Odile Madden. And Odile is uh, a, a material scientist at the Smithsonian. And she, um, believe it or not, is an expert on plastics. But the way she thinks about plastics is is very deep and very fascinating. She thinks about what happens to plastics when we discard them, where they end up, what's going to happen to them in the future, how they transform, what kind of a, what kind of a uh, signature are we leaving for the future in this, this Anthropocene layer, which is at least partly going to be, be defined by the plastics that we're depositing on Earth now. So Adil is, uh, has an interesting perspective as well on all this. So uh, I am now going to... Um, Seed the floor, and uh, I, who, who wants to go first? Should I? Um, are you good, David? Sure. Let's, let's start. Why not? Let's start with David, and we'll right. work over this way. And, and each of them will speak for up to ten minutes, given their perspective, and then we'll we'll start the conversation. So, David Biella. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for uh, coming out uh, early on a muggy Thursday morning in D.C. Um, I want to preface what I'm going to say about the future with this. Uh, anecdote about Scientific American. Uh, we're the oldest continually published magazine in the United States since 1845. We even beat the Atlantic. I know that's a favorite here in DC. Um, and our first cover was of a high-speed train. It went 40 miles per hour. Our take was, why would anybody want to go that fast? So pretty much everything I'm going to say today will probably be wrong. Um, so take everything with a big grain of salt. Um, I'm going to argue that civilization itself is a kind of a technology for transmitting information and infrastructure to future generations. And some of the most important information and infrastructure we might want to transmit to future generations is what we like to think of as nature with a capital N. So this is a kind of everything from genetic uh, information from a rare and unique butterfly uh, to, uh, you know, milkweed and how it interacts with oak trees uh, in the eastern forest. Um, that is information that I think our descendants might like to have. It's certainly information we seem to uh, profit from. Uh, it's information that if we lose it, uh, we are losing more than we might think. And this is an old argument, uh, you know, ecosystem services and, and the rest of it. Um, but I would also argue that technology is finally giving us the opportunity uh, to capture much of this information and put it in a, a wonderful institution like the Library of Congress or the, or the Smithsonian. We have these great institutions, these great institutions, these great infrastructure that we have inherited from our ancestors where we can store some of this information for future generations because we're not doing a great job of storing it in the wild. Um, that is uh, not happening too well. We are kind of uh, running a little bit roughshod over the rest of the uh, natural systems of the planet, as David set up with the, uh, what we're doing with water. You can imagine what that means for fish. Um, and we can see that all around us. So uh, that's the argument that I would make. Uh, and the good news is that, uh, like I said, technology, we are kind of on the cusp of, of being able to capture much of that information. So. Uh, the genome revolution, the genetics revolution can allow us to kind of uh, 
freeze them all and let our descendants sort it out. Uh, if they want to rebuild the Lang's Metalmark uh, butterfly, uh, because we let it go extinct in the Antioch dunes outside San Francisco, they may be able to do so. Uh, and it, we also, with uh, institutions like NEON, the, uh, we are gaining the ability to map ecosystems whole so that we can provide, almost like a book, this blueprint for what the eastern forests look like. Uh, one caveat to all this before I, before I finish is that I'm not arguing for uh, stasis. Uh, the, the world is all about change. We are part of that change. We're not, we're not uh, I'm not arguing that we're bad. Uh, uh, we are in a unique position because of this Anthropocene era uh, to kind of uh, impose our will, if you will, uh, on the rest of the planet. And that is a unique responsibility as well. And we should take that with, uh, with some real, uh, real rigor. And, uh, and that's about all I have to say on the subject. Probably wrong, like I said. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, I think you're right. Um, uh, my uh, my answer to the <laughs> the, the question of um, uh, what what should we choose to save um, is resilience, and that may seem to be an obscure uh, answer to start with, but it emphasizes that rather than identifying what we should uh, save, uh, we first need to figure out as a society, um, as a globe. Um, the principles to live by in the Anthropocene. Um, so I'd like to take a few minutes to um, develop that, uh, that answer, and I'll be referring to some notes to kind of stay on track. Um, and I'll, I'll do so from the particular perspective of a person who is uh, steeped in the study of, of human evolution, the long view of um, how we got here, uh, who we are as a species, and why understanding it matters. Uh, as uh, some of you know, I'm, uh, I've, I'm fond of saying that my research uh, combines uh, the two least controversial areas of science in American society, evolution and climate change. <laughs> um, so I'll, let me start with the paleoclimate part first. Um, the, uh, the past six million years, uh, that period corresponds also with the period of human evolutionary history. And on a global scale, that time that has been uh, one of the most uh, dramatic intervals of uh, environmental change, climate oscillation, environmental instability uh, of the Cenozoic era, the last, about the last 65 million years. Uh, every single paleoclimate and paleoenvironmental uh, record um, that has been studied over the past 40 to 50 years uh, has uh, two signals to it. It has a directional trend, and it has variability, oscillation, and amplitude of variability. And up until about 20 years ago, uh, every student of, uh, of human origins uh, emphasized the direction uh, of change. They considered the variability simply noise in the all-important uh, trend toward a cooler and drier uh, planet, so, for example, the development of grassland savannas uh, in Africa or ice age conditions in, uh, in northern latitudes. Uh, and it's this direction of uh, climate change, uh, the onset of a particular ancestral condition or, or setting uh, that was thought to signal uh, the, um, the, and the illicit and elicit the development of uh, uniquely human adaptations. Things have really changed over the last 20 years. And um, all of those um, you know, many, many dozens of environmental uh, records show evidence uh, of um, dramatic um, instability, uh, variability between wet and arid, between cool and, uh, and warm. And thus, variability and uncertainty uh, have become the theme uh, in the environmental story uh, of, of human origins. And so as a result, the overarching narrative uh, of uh, human evolution um, has significantly changed. Uh, it has changed from a story of uh, how the human lineage came uh, to have dominion over a particular ancestral environment 
to a story of evolving, to use the term David used in his introduction, a story of evolving adaptability and resilience and persistence in the face of survival challenges. And so the fundamental social, ecological, and uh, behavioral adaptations of humans are now considered to be those that favored the adaptability of human ancestors, of our ancestors, raising the ability to moderate the world around us, around our ancestors, to buffer uh, uncertainty and change, and to survive novelty. Uh, and this occurs through an extraordinary ability to modify the surroundings. So beginning a little bit before two and a half million years ago, the ability to pick up a rock and to alter it and make sharp edges and to have crushing rocks enabled uh, those ancestors of human beings uh, to exploit all of the different foods that anything from an elephant to a lion could eat in the, uh, in the African uh, setting. Um, the learning of the ability to control fire and to build simple shelters, which occurred over the last one million years, were the implements of surviving uh, new conditions and new environments. Uh, the expanding uh, brain and ultimately the development of symbolic communication, also developments over the past uh, one million years. These were the tools of our plasticity, of our cultural uh, capabilities, uh, learning and multiplying the number of minds uh, that could be, uh, uh, that could spread the risks and that could raise the degree of security uh, in an uncertain world. And all of these things that I've mentioned that we can study in human evolutionary history are small things, small ways of changing the immediate surroundings, but it became a way of life so successful that Homo sapiens, initially Homo erectus, with very, very simple tools, and part of the um, complement of what it means to be a, a human being today, spread to, um, beyond Africa to other parts of the world, but with Homo sapiens to truly become a global, uh, a global phenomenon. And so the conclusions that, dr that come from these perspectives, these new perspectives on human origins, that I think are part of the starting point of the conversation here today from my standpoint, um, is that during the era of human evolution, the natural world has not had an enduring, stable baseline relative to the survival conditions of organisms. Uh, over the past several million years, there have been high rates of extinction in most group of, uh, of vertebrates, and this is true even of our own evolutionary history. Uh, of the um, minimum of uh, 18 different uh, species uh, of bipedal evolutionary ancestors and cousins uh, recognized in our evolutionary group. We're the last survival. We're the last biped standing. Uh, and all of the other ways of life of earlier ancestors, earlier hominins have gone extinct. Uh, even though each species possess some of the um, unique distinguishing characteristics of, um, of human life as we know it today. Uh, the difference between humans today and our extinct immediate relatives in the evolutionary sense um, is that our basic adaptations rely so heavily uh, on uh, modifying uh, the surroundings. Altering our, our surroundings is our mode of survival. Uh, Homo sapiens possesses through its natural evolutionary heritage an extraordinary capacity to to modify landscapes, uh, food, water, uh, other resources, and we also have an extraordinary capacity to alter ourselves. Um, we have an unprecedented proclivity to alter our ways of life, our belief systems, um, our transactions with one another, and this is of course responsible for the immense diversity of uh, human cultures and behavioral um, uh, ways of life. And so the key starting point in our discussion from, uh, uh, in my view, is that we live in a world, we live in the world uh, by altering it. And it's a function of our basic adaptations, enabling us to buffer uncertainty and instability by changing how the world is. Uh, so let me just finish then by mentioning what I consider to be three factors 
that are part of this discussion um, in this panel and also today, uh, three factors that are critical in raising uh, resilience and thus critical to life in the Anthropocene. Um, number one, there is an immense need uh, for a planetary narrative, and one can even expand this to a solar system narrative and a cosmic and universe uh, narrative. Um, but a narrative where we see one another as humanity, as one species, that we're all in it together uh, in terms of solving the continuing problems um, of resilience and adaptability. The second factor is one that I've um, been churning around in my mind the last several months, and it's a factor that I call the moral responsibility dilemma, uh, which arises from the fact uh, that humans, and therefore the Anthropocene, are a global phenomenon. Um, we're all probably familiar with the idea of the commons uh, dilemma, what sometimes is called the tragedy of the commons, uh, where rational self-interest leads uh, people to maximize their use of a shared resource for which they do not pay. Uh, and this results in resource depletion um, because people do not feel personally responsible for maintaining that shared resource. Well, the corollary of that is this idea of moral responsibility dilemma, and it runs something like this, that in a situation uh, where people perceive that uh, self-restraint um, is important in sustaining a resource or in solving a particular environmental problem or in continuing and raising our resilience, um, that that's great, but at the same time, if there is also a perception that others, including others in our society or other nations on the globe, do not share a similar belief or commitment to it, then there's this disparity. What develops is a sense of unequal moral investment. Uh, and what it, when that occurs, I think personal responsibility goes down the drain. It's not adopted and there is no restraint or solution uh, that occurs. And so solving this uh, dilemma, uh, its impact on the psychology of human action, uh, I believe will be a major project of the Anthropocene. And I think it will be impossible to make progress on the dilemma without a planetary one species uh, narrative. Uh, and then finally, the Anthropocene, uh, like all other eras in uh, human evolutionary history, uh, will be a time of mistakes. It will be a time of errors from a lack of knowledge and understanding of the world. Uh, there's so much that we don't, do not have a handle on uh, regarding the resilience of ecosystems and the interconnected resilience of organisms uh, and human economies. Um, there's a lot that we do not know about the impact of well-intentioned uh, human actions in trying to build resilience. And so in the end, um, activities uh, such as, as, as David mentioned, archiving uh, genetic diversity, uh, developing seed banks, and sustaining and growing even um, human behavioral diversity, um, these are all worth developing our capacity. And the reason why is it's because these will be the critical buffers to our errors, to our mistakes. Uh, the Anthropocene will require and is requiring vast pools of knowledge about the interconnected human and non-human domains of our anthropogenic Earth. I'll finish there. All right. Thank you, Rick. Um, love deal. I had a slightly different perspective. When I saw the topic, um, David gave me the nature of nature, what should we save? I thought, oh God, I shouldn't be sitting up here making any such decision, um, especially not before 10.30 and on one cup of coffee. Um, I was pretty overwhelmed by the question, especially since I'm not a biologist. I'm a material scientist and I work at the Smithsonian in a group called the Museum Conservation Institute and our job is to study the preservation of the collections. And we do that from a material point of view. So we study the materials of which things are made that are in the collections. Um, and I tend to look at things that were made by people. 
um, and we look at the technologies by which they were made. So the question to me of what should we save seemed that we should be talking about species preservation, and that's just, it's not my area beyond uh, having a personal interest. Um, but then I started thinking, but wait a minute, my job is to save stuff, and there must be something there uh, to talk about. Um, and I focus on modern materials, so things that came, were made after 1800, um, materials that didn't exist before 1800. So when Rick was talking about shaping stone tools, um, in the Stone Age, we found objects and we could modify them into often different shapes. So looking at stone, but also bone, wood, found objects. Um, and we'd want to make one sharper or pick one that would be very good for pounding. Um, we've got different materials now after 1800. And um, I study plastics, uh, which is sort of the enemy to the nature in the popular press. Uh, mm -hmm. But if um, I looked, for, I was thinking of two trends that I see in the change in materials since 1800, and one is that we've put together, um, we've discovered how to multiply our force. So force multiplying technologies would be like steam engines or fossil fuels. Uh, I don't know how many of you vegetable garden. Do any of you have vegetables? I started it this year. It's really hard. Uh, it's very hard to make a tomato. <laughs> and the idea that one would feed oneself and actually make one's clothes and make one's clothes with colors or maybe patterns is really difficult. Um, so we've got, in time of my existence and of yours, we have no concept of how to make things with just our own force without having extra add-ons, um, which is often by turning on an engine or plugging something into a wall. The other thing we've overcome is seasonality. Um, when you look back at past technologies from the Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, um, a lot of what you're looking at is agricultural tools, tools that helped you get through the day, and those were tied to the seasons. There was the harvest. There was storing enough food to get through the winter. We don't have to do that anymore. I can get arugula any time of the year, more or less, and it comes in a nice little plastic container. I don't really have to think in terms of how my life it ties to the earth. Um, my world is just full of green things when I want them. Um, and I think that's definitely true in the developed world for many of us, that we don't have any more this tie to how, if it rains or not, or if it's sunny or not, how that's going to affect whether or not I eat, what I get to wear, um, where I get to go, and how comfortable I'll be doing it. So um, that's what I see about materials that have, have happened post-1800. They've really changed our, um, our lives in some very ways that are more fundamental than the materials themselves. Um, and then also working at the Smithsonian, we, I work in a museum where we collect stuff. We're often called the nation's addict. We're much more exciting than that. Um, but if I think about the things I look at that are in the collections, my favorites are, um, Congressman Smith was talking about flying, going into space. The concept of flying is pretty cool. I, we, the idea that we could get, we're, I think the only we are one of the only animals that has managed to get ourselves into the air, uh, when, and we weren't already able to do that, but through technology have been able to fly. So if you think of the spacesuits, being able to go from 1903 with the first powered flight of the Wright brothers to 1969, we're able to go all the way to the moon and live in essentially a woven plastic and metal suit and walk around with no air, a pressure that's not comfortable for us, um, we wouldn't be able to survive without these materials that we've made. So the idea that we can use our technology to fly and go to other planets or bodies up in space is pretty cool, right? And it's neat that we can preserve examples of those tools that we did that with, right? To learn, to look at our accomplishment. Other things that we've done, artificial heart, um, prosthetics, biotech, um, the American Smithsonian's National Museum of American History has three examples of the first artificial hearts. We've figured out how to overcome the weaknesses of our parts. Like if you couldn't walk, or you couldn't chew, or you couldn't see, back when that was the end, that was game over. And we can now get, a, we can now make a a heart, an artificial one, stick it in ourselves and that can keep us pumping. We also, you know, you can get a hip replacement and I think you're supposed to be up and walking within like five days. Like, get yourself up and around because then you'll feel much better. I mean, we can actually make people who could not walk, walk again. That's pretty amazing for our own longevity. 
Um, and then we've also got, also in the American History Collection, there's uh, the Big Mac foam clamshell from McDonald's. <laughs> Right. We also recently, the museum also recently acquired a collection of those plastic sippy cup lids that go on our coffees, that go on mine. Um, from a design point of view, these white, you know, the white ones. Uh, those are in the collections now, and those were never meant to last more than like 20 minutes of use, right? So, but it says a lot about our values. Um, they're important to save because they talk about how we live, and we live very differently than we, um, have before, let's say, as a benchmark, 1800. So um, those are the things I think of uh, when I think of our technology, um, and was specifically with respect to the Smithsonian. Um, so technology, I'm, I'm um, continually impressed by our ability to invent things, so much so that I'm really not surprised by it anymore. If you give somebody, if you give all of our bright university students a task, we need to make a this that can do that. They can do it. Like, they'll come up with some solution, right? The more, humans are very good at that. We have a great proclivity for technology and a real desire and satisfaction in making new technologies. What's more challenging, I think, is for us to define the problem. What are we looking to, what problem are we looking to solve? What challenge are we facing? And when we're looking at the planet, um, life on Earth, I think we're looking at a much more complex system than we as humans are suited to thinking about. Uh, so how do we, can we get together with a collective mind and start defining what's important to us? David talked about banking uh, genetic diversity uh, so that we can recreate a butterfly. There's a, there are some people who have suggested that well, why do you even need to recreate the butterfly? You've got its code. You've got all the information you need. So talking about those priorities like, um, one priority is that we need a butterfly to be a butterfly. We need it to be beautiful and flutter around, and we need it to actually help carry pollen, the other things that butterflies do. Again, not a biologist, um, <laughs> but really. Uh, but we do have priorities. I think that if we sit and think about what's really important to us, and a lot of those things are going to be about beauty, interconnectivity with the environment, um, if we manage to do that, then maybe we'll be able to use this great capacity we have for inventing stuff to do, to continue to do things that are useful. So. Wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all. Um, now, you have the opportunity, if you'd like, to respond to anything that uh, has, has been said so far. Um, well, I do wonder, you know, you talked about all the uh, vertebrate extinctions and how we're the last hominin standing. And I know we may or may not know this, but how responsible is Homo sapiens sapiens for taking out our cousins and taking out the mammoths and the rest of it? Right, right. Um, probably not, um, well, in terms of, our, of, of other hominin species, we're probably not responsible. Uh, for that, the earliest clear evidence of, uh, of anything, I mean, you know, we, we, it's, it's interesting going back to uh, Raymond Dart, the uh, person who uh, first named the genus Australopithecus, uh, the first, uh, at that stage, earliest African uh, 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 human ancestor. Um, he really grappled in the light of World War I and especially World War II with the problem of you know, how we became such killers and murderers, and he took it way back into our evolutionary uh, history, and there's, there's nothing, there's absolutely nothing resembling a battleground or a killing field or even an injury that could have been produced by another hominin that's in the fossil record prior to actually the Neanderthal fossil, the original Neanderthal fossil that's on display in our Hall of Human Origins at the Smithsonian. A, 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 a skeleton from uh, Shanidar, Iraq, uh, which has a, uh, a, a wound inflicted to the ninth rib on the left side from a sharp object. Um, and that's uh, about 45,000 years old. Um, so there's nothing that seems to be indicative of that. However, with regard to other, um, the megafauna and extinctions, it seems that this coupling of climate um, shifting and humans combined was a really devastating kind of impact in certain areas of the world. Um, but it's very, very difficult to tease apart um, human impact and natural impact, largely because human impact is in response 
to changes in the environment. And so you always have those two things coupled together, which is why it historically, in the history of science, and especially over the last 20, 30, 40 years of debate, it's been very difficult to tease those factors apart. And then this gets into that argument about how old is the Anthropocene. You know, are we talking about something that started with the atomic age when we started laying down rare isotopes, or are we talking about something that started 10,000 years ago when we started burning, or 40,000 years ago when we started burning vast landscapes in, in Australia? Or, yeah. or I, I, I think that that discussion, which I think, David, you alluded to, is, um, or that debate is, you know, minor, relevant. But fun. Yeah, it's, 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 also, it's the pronunciation fun. game is fun. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> well, one, you know. one, one of the burning uh, debates is whether it's Anthropocene or Anthropocene, or as they say in, in, in England, Anthropocene. That's right. But actually, getting back to, to we'll something, later. something you just said, Rick, I mean, and, and the, t the, the title of, of this discussion, The Nature of Nature, you, you spoke about uh, human impacts versus natural impacts. And I was thinking, how far back do we have to go where you could start to make that distinction? Because if you think of our, some pre-hominid ancestor and the impact that they would have, you wouldn't call that a non-natural impact. They're just another species. But at some point, we start making this distinction. And part of the insight of the Anthropocene is that maybe that's a, a false or fuzzy distinction because, of course, we're products of nature, and nature is now a product of of us, but I mean, wh where do you think you can start to actually draw that distinction? I think it's a cultural distinction. I don't think it's a real one. Um, there is a natural and humans are coupled. And that we have got to think about the Anthropocene in that light. If we think of them as, well, nature is over here and humans are over here, there's a separation, there's a divide. For one thing, I'm out of the game because as a person, as an evolutionary biologist, interested in understanding humans as uh, arising through natural processes, you, you can't get there from, the, from that assumption. Um, this, this division between a natural world and a human world, between instinct and learning, between nature and culture and things like this. You know, and so the, the evolution of, of human cultural uh, capabilities is a natural phenomenon. And so from a paleoanthropological and deep time human evolutionary perspective, um, nature and, and nature impa natural impacts and human impacts have got to see, be seen as coupled, uh, not separated. Um, I know that may seem like a cop out to your, to your question, but I think we need to solve this conceptual, culturally embedded uh, conceptual um, problem uh, of, this, of this distinction. And, and you're beginning to see this in a lot of interesting literature out there uh, with regard to um, you know, the, the ways in which we need to be able to see nature in our urban environments. That we, if, we, if we are going to be, if we're going to continue with this embedded concept of nature as separate from humans, then nature is always going to be something that exists out there. And now with you know, where humans are not. And now with more than uh, half of humanity uh, in er living in urban environments, um, there's not a chance of, seeing, of ever seeing nature, of ever becoming familiar with it, if we have that embedded concept. So I agree that, 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 that in some sense we're realizing it's a false dichotomy. But if we take that point to its logical extreme, then all of the plastics that Odile studies are all natural products. Mm -hmm. So why worry? <laughs> but they are transformed products. If you look at metals, they come from, I mean, we get, sometimes you can dig up a piece of native metal and hammer it into something, but more often than not, you're dealing with a rock, a couple rocks, and you're melting them and smelting them and putting them into, making them into a metal. It's very alchemical. Like, it doesn't feel much more, it's as magical as making plastic from, say, initially trees and vinegar or hardening a tree sap or taking it from fossil fuels. What Rick, I think, what Rick's saying about tying together natural impacts and human impacts. It, I see this as um, a couple things. First, the idea of a pristine landscape, nature happens over there, means that very few of us are gonna get to interact with nature also. Only if I was in Alaska in June um, on a work trip and got to see some beautiful places and one thing we learned from the parks, National Park Service uh, rangers was that they've found that with some tourists, they find one piece of plastic on a beach, and the report that goes back to the world is, 
there's plastic everywhere. It's no, it's not. It's not natural. Any, it's not natural. We've polluted it. It's one bottle, one plastic bottle on a beach in some of these places. Like, um, and the plastic's definitely a concern. But the idea that we've somehow then spoiled that piece of nature. No, that's check check that one off. Um, we're going to. There are more and more and more of us. We're at, what, 7 billion now? Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to be taking up a lot of the space on the planet. So if we don't start figuring out how nature exists when we and our stuff are in it, we're not going to have a very great chance of protecting this nature or learning to interact with it. So I think. Um, well, you know, it's interesting, too, that um, what I was taught, for example, is that, you know, and maybe you read this. Time Magazine article about honeybees. Mm. And I was taught as a kid in, you know, fifth grade or whatever that honeybees are part of the natural world. Well, you know, honeybees didn't come to North America until the 1600s, brought over in order to do certain agricultural things. They're an invasive species. They're invasive. <laughs> uh, invasive. And, and the, you know, the, the analyses that have gone on about the, the Amazon, and this has been conveyed very elegantly, I think, in uh, Charles Mann's uh, books, um, that, that things that we consider pristine natural environments are actually human-managed environments. Mm -hmm. And so even as we go into trying to figure out, well, what do we do in the Anthropocene with regard to nature, that will also be a human-managed situation mm -hmm. by definition. And so it aligns perfectly with what you're both saying, with that, that we... It, the reality of the world is that we'll, we'll not be able to get away from a human um, embedded situation with nature because that's, and if you look back in time at the kind of stuff that I do with ridiculously long time periods involved, um, that's also the case. You can see it in our evolutionary nature. And this gets to that, you know, what is a butterfly for? And, and really, I think what a butterfly is for or a plant or whatever, is that they hold the answers to questions that we don't even know to ask yet. So we better hold on to that information because it could turn out that, you know, that butterfly holds the gene that allows us to take the trip to Mars without dying from radiation or, or whatever it might be. Um, questions that we don't kind of have good answers to and that we might find in this, you know, natural repository of, of knowledge. That's a very utilitarian yes. view of a butterfly, and, it's, <laughs> I, and I think it's true. Butterflies are also pretty beautiful, and it's, There's hard, more to it than that, it's hard to contemplate a world without them, um, yes. but maybe that's just, just sentimental. But. We're also going to end up in a world of, of uh, just one kind of butterfly. That's the, the Charles Mann argument, which is the homogenous that you know, we'll have a lot of rats and pigeons, and, and there will be nature. It just won't be the kind of abundant biodiversity that we've all come to know and love. And, uh, you know, that may be sad, it may not be sad, depending on, uh, on your perspective. Yeah, I mean, with regard to the, uh, the, the subtitle of this whole session today, um, Will We Survive Our World-Changing Technologies? I think that what's so interesting about this, um, this session today is, um, uh, the many dimensions in which the word we can be considered. And we could be a species as a species, but we could also be just simply status quo of our economic and political systems and, the, and, the, and the, just the way we do things uh, around the world today. Um, the status quo has never survived. It's never survived. Um, but it changes. And so we have to kind of have that as part of our mentality, it seems to me. But the we that comes up in the conversations that, that we were just having has to do with human meaning. And all human actions, all human life, passes through this, this enormous, um, uh, wonderful funnel of human meaning. And the aesthetics of a butterfly and other things are part of human meaning, for better or for worse. I mean, whether it's arbitrary or not. And that has got to also be um, foundational to our future. That can also be a very narrow we, because we're really talking about people who have access to fossil fuels, which uh, is not the entire population. I mean, there's still two billion people out there who don't have electricity or relying on dung or charcoal for their cooking and heating and lighting needs. That is a uh, entirely different we that also needs to be addressed in the Anthropocene, and that's going to be 
uh, I would argue one of the big challenges for us is balancing, like you were talking about, the needs of uh, the butterfly versus the needs of uh, uh, the bottom billion. Um, that's going to be a challenge. Uh, uh, go ahead. It's gone. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. It'll, it'll, it'll come back. Like, like the butterfly. Like the butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm really glad you guys brought up this question of, of what do we mean by the we, because you know, one answer to, the, to this question, will we survive our world-changing technologies, is, well, who wants to know? I mean, who's asking and who, uh, and, and, and it's, it's really, it's really a, a fascinating thing to start contemplating when, when we start discussing this and coming up with answers, we could conceivably come up with a great answer. Oh, here's all we need to do and that this will actually work and it'll solve this dilemma of how we survive with our technology. But if, if just the people in this room even somehow came to such an agreement, what is that? What does that do for us? If, is, is we actually humanity that needs to figure out answers and implement solutions? And when has humanity ever done anything uh, collectively? And, and we also want to preserve uh, diversity, right? I mean, you, you think about all the languages that are also going extinct. Those are repositories of some pretty intense and specific local knowledge, often tied to biodiversity, that we're losing at the same time. And uh, that is part of the we that I would argue we want to be cataloging and preserving as well, rather than just kind of letting that go. And to, I remembered my point. Um, with what should we save, I think that we all agree morally that we should save people, all of them. We don't like the idea of people dying. Um, and I've, a very wise colleague of ours who's in the audience somewhere, Scott Wing, said, um, he's a paleobotanist, works with Rick at the Natural History Museum, he said, well, you know, a species that has seven billion representatives is really in no danger of going extinct. Uh, we're not, I believe there are people who think that we're not necessarily looking at us all not surviving. It's some segment of us that will be at, will have a more difficult time of it if water levels rise, as it gets hotter, as water becomes scarce. Um, so do we want to think about ourselves as a collective? What's our responsibility to each other? Um, and for, you know, if 10% of us are using 90% of the resources, I think is a sort of general rule of thumb, um, what does that mean for everybody else? So I think those, quite, when we talk about, well, we can, we, can we can technologize our way out of this. Um, we're not looking at some of the more fundamental questions about how do we fit in with the system? Are we using our share of the resources properly? Um, and what does that mean? If we use more, what does that mean? You, you notice that people are always talking about de-extincting, say, the mammoth. They're not talking about de-extincting a tree. Uh, there's a very uh, cultural component to the ways in which we use technology and what attracts our, our interest. Well, there's some extinction that, that we welcome. Yeah. The polio virus, you know. We, the, <laughs> um, and it's really some, hard to Some of out. us would say the mosquito, although I know there are birds that like mosquitoes, so yes. I know. <laughs> very difficult to wipe out. The idea of um, also, I think, I really think some of these questions come down to philosophy. Uh, I, I'm a conservator of sculpture originally, and I was an Italian major as an undergrad, so I came from a solid humanities background and went back into material science later. And I find that when people speak to me as a scientist, they sometimes adopt a tone that's kind of assuming I'm Rain Man, where anything <laughs> human is taken out of it. They explain things to me in terms of toxicity or statistics or spectroscopy, um, and they take out the human questions that for me are more important um, and make life more interesting. But when we talk about what species we want to save, there's an element of nostalgia in that. Where do we set these baselines? Uh, I think that we don't want things to change based on our own experience. We don't want, this used to be a, this used to be a walnut grove uh, or a walnut orchard and now it's tract homes. We're very upset about that. That's the na man-made nature that we are sad to lose. So I think looking sometimes at questions of what's our motivation, sometimes it's a very profound human sadness over loss of something we thought was important. Um, but at a very heartfelt level rather than just a scientific level. And that makes me wonder why a butterfly doesn't, in the moral dilemma Rick posed, does a butterfly have a right to exist just because it's a butterfly, it's alive, it's there, and we don't have the right to, we should be not 
wiping out the butterfly just because the butterfly has a right to exist beyond what it might be able to do for us later. So we can pump yeah, that this, to the culture yeah. panel, right? Mm -hmm. We can pump that to the culture panel yeah, later? Yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll return to that. At this point, I want to open up the discussion to the room. Uh, let me say a couple of things. Uh, the panelists for the, uh, the discussions later this morning, who, many of whom are sitting in this area, are welcome to participate. If, uh, if you start to dominate, I'll try to uh, exert some prerogative so everyone can speak. But at the, at the end of the day, all the panelists from all the panels are going to um, get up here and participate in a wide-ranging discussion. So anything that gets raised that we don't get to address now that seems important, uh, hang on to it, we'll, we'll have a chance to come back. But uh, right now, oh, and there are microphones. Uh, Jason is holding one in the back of the room there. So if it's your turn to speak, if you're raising your hand, wait till the microphone gets delivered. And um, now we'll start to take questions. I think I saw one over here. Uh, should I state my name for the records or not? <laughs> Uh, David Schwartzman. Well, uh, thanks for a very stimulating exchange. Uh, I wanted to, uh, I thought someone would raise the paradox of what you would do if you saw an endangered animal eating an endangered plant. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Save them both. It, this actually leads to a serious issue uh, about saving ecosystems rather than individual species, and I'm I'm wondering whether the genome database really captures no. uh, the whole story because you have epigenetic interactions, which now we know are very important. Mm -hmm. I also, so I'd like you to reflect on that, but I also wanted to comment on Richard Potts' uh, invocation of the tragedy of the commons, uh, Garrett Hardin's famous uh, uh, provocation. I think a lot of us know that uh, a Nobel laureate, a late Nobel laureate, uh, did serious critique of this, Ostrom, I believe. And so we might start to think of the tragedy of privatization rather than the tragedy of the commons. Uh, I remember wearing a t-shirt at a bioastronomy meeting that said the earth is not for sale. So the question is, uh, this is a political challenge of expanding the commons and make it, at, and leading to what Richard Potts said, we have a collective responsibility to preserve it. Okay, those are my questions and comments. Thank you. So I'll quickly respond to that uh, technology question, which is the genome is necessary, but not, definitely not sufficient. That's why I brought up NEON, where we're on the cusp of via remote sensing, LIDAR, all these other uh, technologies trying to get a grasp on say, a hectare of ecosystem. So that we can, uh, in a sense, uh, catalog every uh, species that's in there, how they're interacting, how they're growing, watch them over time. Time is an important component. You don't want just a, you know, static snapshot of that, gro of that hemlock grove or whatever it was, because that doesn't tell you enough about how these things change over time, how they maintain resilience uh, and, and things of that nature. So for sure, it's really all about the ecosystem. You're right about that. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that, that the, the genome projects do not, um, and seed banks do not capture the interactivity that is absolutely critical to functioning and resilience uh, of, uh, of ecosystems. With regard to your uh, other point, yeah, I'm, I'm very aware of the uh, critique of the, uh, the tragedy of the commons uh, argument. But I think that the, the moral responsibility corollary is actually an extension that, that, that helps, is a corrective to that, that problem in the way that you were, uh, you were suggesting. I, I'm facing this right at the, the moment, a, a lot of us are facing it at the moment, in a variety of small scales around the, around the world. Uh, at my, the, the field site where, where I've worked and have had uh, the, the you know, privilege of working over the last uh, 28 years in the Rift Valley of southern Kenya, um, the uh, Maasai have always considered that you know open land. It's 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 uh, it's it's common. It's not privatized. But in starting in 1986, the land was divided by the government, and Maasai started buying it. And now they are facing a real problem of well, we all use everyone else's land in order to graze our livestock and to go for water. 
Um, and um, so how do we solve this problem of, yeah, it's my land, these are my trees, these are, these are my resources, but it, yet, yet it belongs to everyone. And, and one of the things that's really interesting over the last two years is that all the Maasai of the area have gotten together and from a grassroots movement have decided to turn the entire area of this part of the Rift Valley into a, essentially a nature conservancy and a cultural conservancy. It's not divided up into nature and culture. The Maasai see the world as nature and culture as being absolutely 100% connected to one another as a whole. And so it's gonna be interesting to follow such experiments in the Anthropocene at, at other scales besides our big urban societies. And just to come back to David's point about technology, um, the genome tells us what's there. It doesn't talk about the interconnectivity of those units and how they, yeah, how they interact, um, which is really, I think, fundamental to an ecosystem or any system. Um, it's about interaction. When you've, the ways that we can measure those interactions, that's where ideas like LIDAR and data gathering technologies come in. So it could be something from photography, it could be LIDAR, it could be, I Sensors. Sen various sensors. Satellites. At the core of all that, as one who has to collect and inter interpret that data <laughs> regularly, at the end of the day, you still need a human computer. Like, we are, I think that we're the best computational engine that we have if we choose to use that engine well. So we decide what kind of data we want to collect. We decide how we, why we want to collect it. And once we've got that data, what kind of story are we going to tell with that data and how's that useful to us? Interpretation. Um, and I also do address your, you know, endangered species eating an endangered plant. That happens all the time. Uh, the Lang's Metalmark butterfly that I brought up is, in fact, an endangered butterfly outside San Francisco. It lives on an endangered species, and the Your Fish and Wildlife Service is, is spending oodles of money to try to preserve both, despite the fact that the uh, ecosystem as a whole, uh, because of a gypsum plant, because we mined the sand dunes that they used to live on, has been totally transformed. So you can get kind of blinders on and, and, and focus on just the plant and just the butterfly when it's really about this whole ecosystem. And then you have to, you know, can we bring that ecosystem back? I, that's a really tough challenge. Yeah, that's an excellent question, excellent point. Uh, we have another question right here in the uh, front row. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Franz Geil. Um, first, I want to preface that science and technology is, is what I do. It's what I eat. And so I preface that because um, I, I want to go to the question of the need for a common global understanding of, of, of the value. What should we value? And the need for that to happen fast because we have two exponentials. The, the good exponential is the machine exponential. You know, we had watts in the computer. Uh, already a few years ago, and we may have machines passing the, the Turing test, indistinguishable from humans in the 1920s, I mean the 2020s. So things are happening very fast. At the same time, we have the exponential threats, the exponential growth of plastics, for example, uh, as pollution, um, and other bad things that are happening. So there's a need for speed. But I'm thinking that maybe we already have that common basis. And the reason I, I preface it science and technology is because I have taken a big interest in scripture, all scripture, everybody's scriptures, Hindus, the Analects, uh, the Islam, everything across the last few years because of the importance of the strife that we have in the world today. And I have found they have a very common basis within what we call the golden rule. But there's more to that, because the golden rule, the way we look at it, we look at how we treat each other. The golden rule is embedded in every one of those great philosophies and religions. But if we look at, I'll take, I'll take the Torah, the five books of Moses, for example. That's, if we take God and religion out of it, let's just look at it as the wisdom of our ancestors. That's what it is. And they were indeed wise, maybe wiser than us. So we go to those five books, which is a basis for three great religions, at least, in this world. So in terms of a, a rule that we can go by, the golden rule, well, how about applying that to nature as well? And if we do that, if we can look at what, the, what did the elders say? Well, if we go back into those books, we go into a story of Noah. Well, there are seven commandments that Noah received through revelation or 
from his ancestors, however it came about, in terms of the humane treatment of animals. Now, animals back then were simply nature. It was food, it was a threat, or it was a disease threat, one, one of those three. So it certainly wasn't the relationship that we have with dogs and cats today. It was just nature. But yet, the strong emphasis on the humane treatment of animals that has led to what is halal, what is kosher, and our whole concept of humanity, uh, humane treatment of animals today. In terms of respect, the golden rule applying to nature, treating nature as we would treat ourselves. Um, maybe there's already a common foundation there, and if there was more discussion on it, because people seem to say, well, that's religious, that's doctrine. Well, no, that's just wisdom. That's wisdom of ancestors. So I think we already have it, and I don't know how, what, how much has to be reinvented on the moral side. Well, let me, let me comment uh, about that very, very briefly. I think that there is a, an extraordinary uh, need for the biocentric um, values and anthropocentric values to be one and the same. And this is tied in, I think, very strongly with your uh, observations about the, the uh, you know, what Houston Smith called the wisdom traditions um, of a uh, ver variety of uh, uh, religious and philosophical traditions that actually do value um, a, uh, a, the connectivity uh, between the, the human and the non-human domains of the, of, of the planet. Um, yet at the same time, I think that there are extraordinary narratives that cultures around the world tell themselves about their specialness. Okay, and that's where I'm coming from, where that in addition to the identities of people that need to be maintained for the purposes of maintaining and sustaining and growing uh, cultural diversity, languages, and things like this, that there also needs to be an overarching um, narrative that is based upon our kinship with one another. Um, if you look at, at uh, the Torah, if you look at uh, other uh, religious texts, a lot of that is actually built upon the foundation of kinship and recognizing kinship as the basis for interacting altruistically, kindly toward one another um, with care in, in mind. And so the evolutionary narrative is a narrative of a, an extraordinarily grand kinship system. And if we've got, if kinship is about people who are relating to one another through proximity, the planet is now, kinship has been, the concept has necessarily been expanded because we can fly around the planet in a day. Um, See each other, right? We, through the internet and tweeting, we can have connection with many more people than we could have before we could fly. So, so I, I, I'd also argue that it's, uh, well, as a former Catholic schoolboy, it's really about interpretation. Um, you can pull whatever you want out of the Bible. Uh, you could go for the golden rule, or you could go for, man, I give you dominion over the, you know, the birds and the beasts, and that's it. And that, you know. So there are interpretations you might want to embrace, and there are interpretations that uh, have proved somewhat uh, damaging so in this present you, moment. Are you advocating cherry picking of wisdom? I always advocate cherry picking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I also was raised Catholic, and two uh, things to watch out for that I'm reminded of are gluttony and pride. So we don't. We'll, I never hear about this. We'll punt that to the culture <laughs> panel again. Let's punt to the culture people. Okay, I guess we have a, a question here and then over here. Hi, uh, Lindsay Hayes. Um, you guys all spoke today about how much, um, how, how much the human influence is everywhere. Your comment about there's plastic on a beach on this remote beach in Alaska means that you know, humans have touched either literally or figuratively every aspect of this planet. And since the title of this panel is, let me remind myself, um, uh, what should we choose to save? I guess my question is, how do we address the biases of when we go out and we see something in nature and say, oh, this is the natural way of things? How do we address the fact that if we have influenced everything, how do we know that what we're saving is not some relic of the human influence? Thank you. This is the problem of shifting baselines. That's the uh, technical term. It, it first came up in fisheries science. Essentially, uh, people realized that they were basing their uh, worldview of, of the way that the ocean should be 
on whatever the ocean was like when they were born, which was different for the preceding generation where they were coming to the end of their lives and saying, oh my God, the ocean is destroyed. You're born in 1970, you're like, ah, it's not so bad. And then by 1990, you're like, oh my gosh, the ocean is destroyed. Meanwhile, the people who are uh, born in the 1990s are like, ah, it's not so bad. We, you know, we've still got jellyfish. Um, <laughs> so shifting baselines is a, is a real uh, challenge, I think, in, in these cases. And uh, I'm not sure how, I, I think the, the moment for uh, maybe understanding what the natural baseline was, as you were mentioning with the, in your conversation with Rick, uh, passed a long uh, time ago, and we've got to kind of uh, muddle through, make our mistakes, and uh, make sure that uh, you know we have we we allow for some resilience in the system and don't take out you know 95 percent of the cod. Your, your example actually reminded me of something a professor of mine said in college. I, I took <laughs> took an electronic music class, and the music professor said. Every generation of humans has an irrational and unshakable attachment to whatever music was popular when they were adolescents. Right. And so your parents will swear that Frank Sinatra was the peak of civilization, and then the next generation yeah. will swear that it's the Beatles, and now somebody will swear that it's Lady Gaga. And, you know, and they all have their <laughs> attributes, but, but the, the, the point is that we have to watch our biases for our yeah. own personal nostalgia when we're searching for, uh, for those sort of enduring values that we want to... We also have to watch out for uh, what I would call general generationalism, which is that we're the most important generation that ever was, and everything that we do will set uh, you know, everything going forward. There's some of that for sure, because there's seven billion of us. Uh, we are an important generation, uh, but you know, if, as long as we can shepherd through some of, uh, some of this resilience, I think future generations will be equally important, and they may make very different decisions, which is why I think we need to preserve those choices for them. It's almost time for us to uh, go to our first break, but uh, there was a question over here in the uh, front row. Uh, I'm, uh, okay, <laughs> in that case. Um, there was another that, question over there. Oh, was there one more question? Oh, yeah, okay. They all passed. Can we, um, can we uh, take the question over here and then, and then, we'll, and then we'll break? Yeah. We've beaten you down. No more questions. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Elizabeth. And um, for millions of years, we looked up at the sky for inspiration. And 50 years ago, we used the suits to go into space and discover a new uh, environment. And, and then we looked back at Earth for the first time and were inspired, which inspired the green movement and created a whole new uh, understanding of our identity. Um, soon, hopefully the end of this year, um, we'll have tourists going to space and more people will be inspired by our closest astronomical phenomena, Earth, um, from 3D perspective. How much do you think that space tourism may be possible to help create that planetary identity that you're talking about? Because all of those stories we've been, many of the stories we've been hearing from astronauts and such um, haven't included their experience of seeing Earth from space in a more spiritual way. It hasn't been translated to us as much as I would have liked anyway. <laughs> and um, how much do you think possibly space tourism might help us all see uh, from a planetary perspective? I think David wrote a whole book on this. One oh. thing I'd say, though, is <laughs> that I, I want satellites if, more than if, astronauts. Yeah, if, if I can grab that real, real quick. Um, the, uh, what I worry about space tourism specifically is the inherent elitism, although it may be the leading edge to space becoming more accessible to a larger number of people. But it's undoubtedly true that every human being who's been in Earth has been struck by what, it's not really too strong to call it a spiritual revelation of the oneness the fragility, the, the beauty of Earth, the folly of considering anything but the commons when you look at Earth. And I think that as that experience becomes more common, it can't help but perpetuate that view of humanity as a common entity that Rick would, pointed out is so essential to our solving these kinds of problems. But as David pointed out too, it's not just humans in space, it's the fact that we've now surrounded our planet with a network of cameras and other sensors, and so we get a daily view, for those of us that, that pay attention, of the Earth as a phenomenon from space as a whole, 
unit, and I think that that uh, is, uh, only, can only be uh, profoundly helpful in this shift of perspective that we're discussing here. Thank you. We need you. to keep that up. That's the key part. We need to keep those satellites up there because space tourism, like you said, is going to be for a very small number of people. Final point? Yeah. Tourism, like with museums, is a curated experience. It's not just going and figuring out your own reality while you stomp around and explore the landscape. That could be presented in a couple of ways. It could be uh, presented as domination over space, not just our planet. Or I heard my, I had the pleasure of hearing Michael Collins speak once, the astronaut. There was Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins, who did not land on the, did not walk on the moon, but circled it. And he says, um, when asked about what he thought looking back at the blue marble for the first time, he said it looked very fragile. So can you capture that feeling, looking back at our planet while at the same time you've managed to fly into space and the moon and are sort of dominating uh, the space landscape more? So how do you balance for learn, teaching people to treat the Earth as fragile and also balance that with their feeling powerful? All right, well, thank you all so much. We're um, going to now take, oh, yeah, you can clap. Thank you. <laughs> this has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.